Hello, this is Exchange Master faculty member Steve Bouchard. And in this video here today, I'm going to talk to you about how we're using the Exchange approach to really revolutionize and transform uh, the industry conference and convention space. Uh, if you're not familiar with Exchange, I'll post some links uh, down below where you can get some other resources and videos from our website on what Exchange is and some of the founding principles and, and how we apply that work in other ways. But for today, right now, I'm going to jump into um, a little drawing here that's going to show you how we really apply Exchange in the learning community environment and again how we're specifically using it in industry conferences and conventions to really transform the experience and generate you know, deeper levels of engagement with the audience, um, deeper levels of learning, and just overall better experiences when we bring people together. And so what we found through our work in teams and organizations and also learning communities is that there's kind of three levels of the work that we do. Um, and at the first level, we talk about designing and really facilitating any kind of an event or experience. And so what does that actually mean? And when we talk about design, it's really designing the questions that are going to guide many of the activities that we move our participants through. Uh, because with the exchange approach, many of our activities really start with a question. And we put a lot of thought and uh, time and, and design work into the right questions to generate the right ideas and the outcomes. And then, of course, part of the design process is also, you know, building an effective agenda that's going to uh, create value not only for the people that are together in the room, but also whoever's bringing them together, whether that's a leadership team, whether it's an industry, whether it's a convener. And so we put a lot of uh, time and emphasis around designing agendas and designing questions. When we come to the facilitation part of the experience, you know, it really comes down to three things. First is, you know, how do you move and manage people through an agenda and, and move them and manage them both physically, but also mentally, right? How do you make sure that people are well prepared mentally in the right headspace to answer the questions and have the dialogue that we're asking them to have, but also making sure you can move different size groups of people. And the nice thing about the exchange approach is that it's very scalable, right? So we do this work at the small level with 20, 30 people. We also apply it at a very large level with hundreds or even thousands of people in the room. Uh, and so being, and so knowing how to do that is super important. And then we spend a lot of time and, and attention on the environment that we're bringing people into. And so things like, you know, access to the outdoors, access to fresh air, natural light, plants and other uh, reminders of nature in the room, things like that that really set the stage um, to bring in the right mindset and put people at ease and make them comfortable and really use the space most efficiently for whatever task we're trying to create. And so we like to say that as people enter the room, everything they see, hear, and feel is important. And so we make sure to pay attention to that and design the spaces where we bring people together to meet um, to, to best serve uh, whatever outcome we're trying to generate. And then lastly, there's the element of time. And so how do you manage you know, the agenda? How do you manage the people in the room to be sure you move through the important parts of your agenda um, and deliver on the outcomes that you need to deliver on for the client and the folks in attendance? And so we have um, you know, ways that we can scale activities to compress time or expand time depending on what's available. And then also having the knowledge of what's most important uh, for our clients and for the people in the room to experience or to generate uh, before we go into the event. That's all part of the pre-planning process. And so that's kind of what's happening, you know, we sometimes say above the surface, you're looking at design and facilitation, but there's really some really important things that the exchange approach leverages below the surface. And the first thing I want to talk about is the three different types of capital that we've uh, identified that exist within learning communities. And the first is really intellectual capital. And intellectual capital is really you know why people show up in the first place right they're coming to these types of uh, convenings conferences events to to learn right to get new ideas and to grow whether that's personally or professionally that's why people show up right the second type of capital is what we call uh, relational capital and relational capital is a little bit different in a sense that it's all about kind of networking, right? Building relationships and coming together around a shared purpose. 
So many times we bring people together around a specific industry, around a specific task or challenge or opportunity area. And so there's some level of connection that then exists around that shared purpose. And again, these two first types of capital, intellectual and relational, are largely you know, why people show up to these events. But as an event organizer, a meeting planner, a conference convener, I'm sure that you've seen and can relate to the fact that it's getting more and more difficult to bring people together in these um, uh, live environments, right? Because there's so much information out there and available on the web, in the internet, different virtual learning uh, opportunities. And so how do you get people to really you know, invest the time, the energy, the resources, the money to come to an event? Um, and, and we think that we have the answer through our complete convention or conference 3.0 model. And so the third type of capital that we like to leverage is what we call communal capital. And communal capital, um, you know, somewhat, somewhat simply defined, is really the feeling of being part of something bigger, part of something larger, um, part of a bigger journey, part of a bigger organization. And while intellectual capital and relational capital are why a lot of times people show up, what we found through our work is that communal capital is really what keeps people uh, engaged. It's, it's what makes them stay or what's, it's what makes them come back and return time and time again um, for these types of events. And really at the basis of this um, pyramid here and the, really the foundation of our work is something called psychological safety which you know really has been around for quite some time with Amy Edmondson's work at Harvard. There was a study in 2012, the Aristotle Project by Google, where they studied what are the key elements of a high performing team or high performing organization. Um, and psychological safety was identified as the one most important element for high performing teams and organizations. And then just uh, last year, the exchange organization and the Change Lab did a report that surveyed over 7,000 workers in, in North America, and some really compelling data was presented in that report as far as what drives engagement and, and what makes for successful change initiatives. And so psychological safety is really the basis of what's happening in our events, and, and that's really um, what we uh, who use Exchange develop our events around creating psychological safety and then leveraging and tapping into three, these three different types of capital, intellectual, relational, and communal capital simultaneously uh, through the events that we lead. So you know, what does all of this mean? What does it actually look like in practice? What I'm gonna do now is actually show you uh, three or four different ways that we tactically bring this into events. And so if I talk a little bit about you know, the conference experience, we sometimes refer to conference 1.0 as you know, really a passive experience. So think about people sharing insight, speakers from stage, um, people in the audience listening and receiving information, new ideas, et cetera. And nothing wrong with that, right? There's great information to be had. There's, there's many lives that have been changed and there's, there's many insights that can be received through uh, passive information delivery. Um, and so that can be a great thing. What we found and what, what most people have found is that there's a need for some other type of interaction, right? Some other type of um, um, activity or event that really builds that second type of capital, that relational capital. And so, you know, sort of a 2.0 experience basically adds in some networking. And so you're all familiar with the cocktail hours, the networking events where people come together, you know, after hours typically and, 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 and share and make connections and all of those things. And so most of the conferences that are out there today are a combination of these two things, right? Some passive learning, uh, insight being shared from speakers or subject matter experts on stage, and then mixing in networking, you know, at various times uh, throughout the program or throughout the conference. The challenge with the networking is that in many cases, two things, one, you know, most of the time, one out of two people are very uncomfortable in that kind of an environment. And I'm sure there's some people who are watching this video who can relate to that, where you've been in those networking environments and you're just not really sure how to have a good conversation, not really sure what to ask for. You know, if you don't know anybody, it makes it that much more difficult. So the networking events tend to be not real effective and there's, there's usually not much structure to them. Um, and so the outcome of those events is sometimes hard to grasp. Secondly, they tend to be expensive, right? There, there tends to be cocktail hours or activities or, or different types of 
um, trips that people go on. And so there can be a lot of money invested without a lot of return or at least quantifiable return. And so what we talk about at Exchange is really transforming that conference uh, experience into what we call Conference 3.0 or the Complete Convention. And what I'm gonna do now is just show you a couple different ways that we actually do that in practice. And so, you know, when we take uh, the first step, it's really moving from a passive experience to an active experience. So how do we do that? Well, one of the ways that we do that very simply and very effectively is through what we call an active learning cycle. What does that look like? It's basically asking folks in the conference experience to go through some kind of a written exercise, right? So take a moment, pause, grab a pen and a paper, and write down what you just learned from that experience. Write down your biggest takeaway from that speaker you just heard on stage, and, and really take the time to capture that. We then get people to go into what we call a small group share, and so either turn to the person next to you in a pair, or maybe form a small group of three or four people, and, and just share with each other what your biggest takeaways were. What was the biggest thing that you learned through that experience, that speaker, uh, that event? And then what we do is we actually bring and invite those voices, those learnings into the whole room through what we call a large group share. And so we'll invite people to share what they learned, what their biggest takeaways were within that group with the whole room. And so what we've done there in a very brief period of time, this can be facilitated you know, by a trained exchange facilitator very uh, time effectively in as little as 15 or 20 minutes. We've, we've allowed people the time and the opportunity to really reflect on what they learned, to capture it in writing, to share it with another person verbally, and then invite those uh, shares into the room so that everybody can benefit from it. So we really amplify the learning in that fashion. The other um, um, uh, step that we take after moving from passive to active is moving from expert wisdom to what we call crowdsourced wisdom. And so what does that mean? You know, typically we talked about having a subject matter expert or, or somebody speaking on stage. And that can be a great thing. But think about too, when you bring together two, 300, 400, 500 people into a room around some shared uh, purpose, some shared interest, there's gonna be a lot of talent, skill, uh, life experience in that room that oftentimes goes you know, untapped. And that's sometimes a missed opportunity. And so I'll give you here three quick ways um, that we are able to really tap into that collective wisdom, that group genius, we call it, uh, within the crowd. And, and you can then shift away from uh, so many you know, crowds, uh, uh, experts on stage, subject matter experts, and really leverage what's already in the room. And so one way we do that is through what we call a one-on-one -on -one paired interview. And so what we do is we design some very thoughtful questions that tap into people's skills, people's uh, purpose, people's strengths, what's working really well. And we give people time and space to really interview each other and learn from one another um, around the topics that are of most benefit to them. Um, some of the things that we tend to focus in on can be uh, purpose, right? What's your purpose in being in this organization? What strengths might people have? Uh, we oftentimes bring in future visions, um, could be values, or sometimes we'll refer to those as guiding work principles, and then also intentions, right? So what's your intention for our time together? And these can all be great questions that we interview. And then what happens is after people interview each other one-on-one, -on -one, they'll then percolate that learning even further by finding another pair, introducing one another to each other with a, a structured way that we have that happen, and then going from two to four. And that's a very powerful exercise and typically gets really good feedback. Uh, it allows people to create deep connection, shared purpose, uh, a really great way to start any kind of an event. Another opportunity to tap into or access uh, the wisdom in the room is what we call vote up. And so the, in this activity, we would bring together small groups of people and we would have them share stories or share ideas you know, around something very specific uh, that we pose and present to them. And what happens is people will go around and, and there's a lot of things that you can build this around, right? You could share ideas, you could share lessons or best practices, you could share uh, values, you could share strengths. 
you could even share, um, you know, people, right? Share people's stories. And what happens is the group all shares what they have to contribute. And then as a group, they determine what's the best story within their group, what has the most energy, what might the whole room benefit most from hearing. And then we bring those stories into the room. And so out of a group of four or five people, you get the highest energy, most beneficial, um, most high impact ideas to then be shared with the whole room. And that's again, something that a trained exchange facilitator can move a large group of people through very quickly. And some of the things that come out of that, the learning, the takeaways, the golden nuggets can be uh, really, really powerful. The last uh, method that I'm gonna go over here today in this video is what we call a real time value exchange. And there's a number of different ways that you can uh, actually facilitate this, um, this activity. And so I'll give you one example here. Sometimes we conduct this around what's called an ask, give, win. And so we'll organize people in a semicircle in front of a wall and we'll set up uh, three different kind of categories or three different columns that have these hashtags, ask, give, win. And you could modify that to be a number of different things, but I'll just use this example for simplicity. And then we give people some time to write down, you know, whether it's questions that they have or topics they want to learn about, whether it's uh, a skill set they have or an area of expertise or a success story they want to share around something specific, or if they just want to celebrate a win, right? They want to they want to acknowledge something that they or maybe somebody else in the community was very successful at. And sometimes, you know, we don't take as much time as we should to recognize our own wins. So we'll give people time to capture those things down. And then we orchestrate a really high momentum kind of rapid um, process where people walk up, announce what it is that they want to ask, give, or celebrate. And they just post it on the wall. And we have a methodology that we use that, you know, allows people to track who needs help with what, who has an area of expertise they're willing to share, and who has a celebration they want to acknowledge. And what happens there is we create some connections very quickly around you know, things that people need support with and those that might be able to provide that support in the community. Uh, we also recognize you know, the wins and the successes, and that, that makes everybody feel really good and, and gives them an opportunity to maybe identify, hey, you had success in that area. That's something I want to try and pursue. Maybe I'll connect with that person and learn a little bit about how they were so successful. And so typically when we facilitate that activity at the end of it, we ask people to make at least two connections with somebody here in the uh, community, in the event, where you can either ask them for help or you can you know, support them in some way or you can learn together from a win or a success story. And so it's a way of really creating great connections rapidly giving people the opportunity to connect either there in real time and have discussion, a great activity to do right before a meal, or that they can even just follow up. Hey, at, at some point in the next you know, 30 days, let's get a call on the calendar. Let's get a coffee where we can meet and discuss this topic. Um, so those are you know, three different ways that you can tap into the wisdom of your community through one-on-one -on -one paired interviews, through a vote up process, through a real-time value exchange. And then there's, uh, the, of course, the active learning sequence, which really helps you to shift learning from uh, active, from, sorry, passive to active. Uh, there is one other element here that we talk about sometimes, a 3.3 element, but I'll save that for uh, another video and uh, leave you with this here today. So if you have any more questions on how to actually implement this in an industry convention or conference that you might be convening, feel free to uh, reach out and set up a call and we can have a discussion to learn more. Thanks so much and hope you had a good uh, outcome from this video. Take care, everyone.